No, <laughs> so thank you very much. This is fantastic to be here. Um, I actually live down uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, so it's great to come up and, and hang out in, in Boston today. So I had to be here um, because uh, the, the launch of a new chapter and the fact that you guys all come together, um, wouldn't miss it. Um, this is great that the fact that the group has, has gotten together after all these years, reconstituted, and, and from the, the national level, we want to congratulate all of the folks who did a lot of work over the last few years to, to really pull this together. And chapters are critical to, to the functioning of, of the national level um, association as well. I got my start at the Southern Association, um, and I can tell you I've known folks like Rich and a number of others and that almost 25 years ago and have maintained those friendships, maintained that collegiality. That's a group that I go to oftentimes because they're in my neighborhood. And I can drop in and we can talk about some of the things that are going on. And that happens with all of the chapters that we see um, in, in APOR. One of the things that I find interesting about chapters, too, is that a lot of people think that they're dictated by the national organization, but they're not. The really cool thing about APOR's chapters is they are grassroots. So it's a group of folks that get together with common interests and decide, you know what, we actually want to form a chapter and to be able to have our own meetings and um, and, and do those types of things. And so to me, that is that is a truly a, a organic organization. And that's again why APOR has, has, uh, has really prospered over the years. What's great is you have folks in here that probably are not members of the national chapter, but we also have people that are APOR members that are in the area that would be great if they became members of your chapter as well. So there's a great synergy that goes on uh, between uh, chapters and national. But the other thing that's important uh, about uh, chapters is it does give you those colleagues that you can call on. Let's face it, today is the, where you need help with, with friends. We're in, we're in a very trying time. Uh, some might say, I actually look at it the reverse. I look at it as we have never lived in a time when people have more opportunity to express themselves. There are more ways to conceptualize public opinion today than there ever has been before. And there are more ways for us to measure public opinion. Uh, before. So it, it really is, a, to me, a fascinating time uh, for those of us that you're, if you're on the methodology side, if you're on the insight side, um, we really are, I think, riding a wave. In fact, I would go so far as to say I think that we are in a serious time of change, a paradigm change. Um, most of you probably, you know, in school learned about the you know, about paradigm shifts, and one of the things about paradigm shifts is those that are living through them typically don't recognize it until years later. I think we're seeing the signs, though, of, of being in a uh, paradigm shift in the sense that we had a fairly stable kind of world order in public opinion polling um, that we've seen over time now starting to erode. It's not going away. It's not going to completely crash. Uh, but it is certainly finding uh, troubled waters these days. You've got some new uh, approaches, very new approaches. And I'm not talking here about just the difference between probability and non-probability. I'm talking about some of the radically different types of ways of doing things, some of the big data types of things, social media types of things, very different ways of conceptualizing and measuring public opinion. Those are starting to come to the fore, but we don't know what the rules are. You know, people are experimenting with these things. We don't exactly know how to turn those oftentimes into insights on a continual basis. We have some great instances of success, and I have no doubt that as folks continue to work in those areas, we'll see more of that. So we do have this clash, and we see this going on in our industry as well, as folks that were kind of raised on one side and folks that are coming up on the other side now, um, clashing, and most of the people, quite honestly, most of the APOR members, our members in here, are stuck in the middle. Uh, really wanting to know what do I do? What is it that, uh, you know, if I'm out there and I'm trying to produce public opinion or measuring attitudes or looking at behaviors, how is it that I know uh, that what I'm putting out is fundamentally right? Or if I'm consuming some type of, of, of information about attitudes, how do I know that it's right? And I think that's the fundamental question that we really need to start looking at. We've got to get out of this probability, non probability, yes, no, black, white, zero, one. Uh, type of approach. Uh, that's just not that's not doing us any good anymore. We fought that fight both sides and it doesn't get us anywhere. The real question I think does get back to how do we have a reasonable expectation to know when we are correct? Uh, whether we're putting out data or whether we are consuming data. That to me is one of the key things that, that's driving us. Well A4 hopefully you have seen you know we're in the process of collecting um, abstracts for the conference that's coming up next May. And one of the things the council did this year is to help build on some of the work that has been going on with previous councils uh, and really help us at this issue of how do we know that we're right. We've had a series of task forces over the years 
the availability online, emerging technologies. They've kind of been building to this where we've, we've uh, developed a, kind of a base understanding of where some of these issues are. We've developed this new task force that we're assessing today, Survey Methods Task Force, to come in May and help us to assess how do we navigate in this new world, uh, primarily looking at surveys. They're not looking at big data, but I will tell you we also have another task force that's already looking at big data. So in May, we'll be able to look at both types of things, kind of where the survey world is regardless of the type of sampling you use, and then looking at big data as well. Um, another big thing that's going on in A4 that you have seen, hopefully, is the launch of the Transparency Initiative. Um, Transparency Initiative being those uh, pollsters that are out there, survey organizations that would like to um, you know, publicly uh, go forward and, and document some of the work that they have done according to the A4 code, um, can be part of the Transparency Initiative, and then they get the seal uh, that they can use on uh, their websites or other areas that they want. This becomes important because I think transparency is, is really the key standard that we should be looking at in this, in this new world. Um, again, we've been criticized at some point, some folks have written on, on blogs that, uh, oh, if you're a standards organization, then you're anti-innovation. Well, that's just baloney. The two things can certainly uh, and certainly do um, live together. A4 is a great example. I'm sure in this room we have individuals whose job day in day out and passion is to push the envelope, to find new types of, of ways of, of again conceptualizing and measuring public opinion. We have those people in A4. The Survey Monkey people. Those people are A4 members that are doing that work. The NBC people working with them are A4 members. They are out there pushing pushing the edge. We also, though, have individuals then whose day jobs is to produce uh, data. And again, they would like to adopt new methodologies, but they need essentially a rule book. They need to understand what are the best practices, what are the rules by which these new methods can be used. And that's where I see, again, standards coming into play at two levels. I think at one level, we have kind of base standards. Base standards being everybody should be transparent with what they're doing. You know, the basis of science is transparency, so we can understand, we can replicate what it is uh, that's going on. We can evaluate ourselves what's going on. Then, as a methodology matures over time, you might have particular practices that go and standards that go along with that methodology. So to me, at least with the transparency initiative, really looking at are people being transparent with what they're doing so we have a fair chance of being able to evaluate what it is that they are doing. Last but not least, kind of looking to the future. Uh, one other thing that A4 Council did this year in June is to pass uh, essentially a strategy document that we call for 2025. You can find this on, on the website. And the, the idea here is, again, we're in a time of change. And because the way A4 works and the way the chapter here works were probably yearly cycles of a president, and so you don't have people that are there longer term, you need some kind of guidepost to help guide the organization over the longer haul. So what A4 2025 does, it lays out about eight or nine different areas that say in 2025, this is what we think A4 should look like. And again, the, the hope is that between now and then that the, the organization will strive to reach those. It's got several, three things I really want to point out. One was an assessment of what shouldn't change. A4 has been around for you know, 70 some odd years. And, um, what are the key things that have kept that organization around? Well, in reality, it's not the methodologies that have been used. It's the values, um, in particular, the collegiality, transparency, the belief in sharing information, those values. So we see in the year 2025, there shouldn't be a change in that. We should still be an open organization that shares information, that has task force reports that we make available, not only to members, but to everybody in the industry. Um, the second area, though, that's important is to recognize that A4 shouldn't in 2025 be a survey organization. And I say that here as the surveys aren't going away, um, but we should be looked at as an organization that looks at opinions, attitudes, and behaviors in various different ways that they can be measured. So that's why I'm hoping that we will continue to broaden the appeal of, of who is an A4 member. Um, so we're having some very different types of faces, but a, certainly by the year 2025, if not 2015 or 2014. Um, and the last but not least um, is international. And again, we start with the A in our name for American, uh, and yet uh, SMR still has E in their name. We need to recognize that A4 actually is already an international organization. 
if you look at the membership of, uh, at the national level, uh, the fastest growth, and more than 10% of the members are from outside of the U.S. Um, I have the, the great pleasure at Nielsen to work internationally, and I realize that a lot of particularly developing economies, research has now just become something that they're using, and they're just learning how to go about doing these types of things. Organizations like APOR, in conjunction with WAPOR, and Desimar, and ASA, and other groups, can do a lot of good, I think, in these emerging areas in particular, in, in helping folks to, to you start to learn how to do good research um, uh, in, in this day and age. So I see APOR in 2025 being really embracing that international scope uh, that, again, we've already started down that path. Um, I guess that was really all that I wanted to say. I didn't want to take up too much time. I'm not a political pollster. I watch and consume the stuff that you guys put out all the time, so I'm not going to talk about your area because you guys are the experts in this. But I, I do have time for a couple of questions if uh, anybody has any particular burning things that they'd like to ask. And we'll also have a QA at the end as well. But Lois? Yeah, I have a question about your the TI. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what proportion would you say of A4 has signed on to the TI? So, companies, not individuals. Right, proportion, I'll be honest, I don't have the proportion at the top of my head. I will tell you that, and we're going to have press releases that come out, is we're waiting until organizations go through the whole, it's almost like submitting a manuscript, right, because you got to submit stuff and it gets reviewed. And, but we've had um, close to 50 organizations that since it launched uh, earlier in September, uh, we had a kind of a pre-launch with some groups, Over the 50 organizations that are now in the process of being reviewed. So that's a pretty, I think that's a pretty decent, uh, decent chunk. And I know the one there, and it, it's, it's a nice mix of uh, universities, large groups, others. So we're very pleased with that. Other questions? All right, well, I will.